great. Long weekend, okay? Are you more tired today yes. or before we left? Um, yeah, I'm, more I, I'm more tired today. It was not recuperative. No. I think whenever whenever momentum slows, because it's just urgency, go, 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 and it forces you to be urgent alongside it at that, at that pace and attentive. And then as soon as you have a chance at slowing down a little bit, that momentum just takes hold and doesn't, doesn't want to let go. All right, so we will plow ahead with mTOR. We're just going to talk about mechanical signaling today. I was thinking about cramming in both mechanical and hormones, endocrine and mechanical, and then I realized the pace of conversation would be so fast that nobody would get anything out of it. So if we slow down and do each topic as its own day, we'll do mechanical today, we'll do endocrine on Wednesday. On Friday, uh, there's going to be a case study, and I'll post it online on Thursday. And then it'll be due on Saturday, a team, a team case study, another competition. And obviously it's going to be a weight gain one. Um, let's put on you know, strength or weight gain, muscle mass, uh, protein accretion of some kind. And so that will be this coming up case study. What are the points, you know, where to find that stuff. Something like this, something like this is going to be the case study, a mass one. So being ready for that, your team could actually start coming up with answers even though you don't know what the case study is, you really can write your answer now, knowing you can, you can prescribe all of those things or incorporate those into your prescription somehow. Uh, you're gonna have to do this with it, and you're gonna have to do this with it, and then the rest of it's gonna be mTOR. And you know this, mTOR is what I call the synecdoche. It, it's a, a spokesperson or a surrogate or, or some sort of representative of cell signaling, mTOR is. The mTOR enzyme is super important, but it is representative of cell signaling for anabolism. Um, MAPK, we'll talk a little bit more about that one today, and we'll talk about the calcium, calcium, uh, calcium urine. Uh, we'll talk about that pathway a little bit as well, all three of those. You know this, muscle metabolism stuff. You know what cell signaling is, autocrine as opposed to paracrine adjacent, as opposed to endocrine, um, some gland, some cell or gland releases a hormone, it goes out into circulation, eventually finds a target tissue. That would be endocrine proper. And this is really what we're going to be talking about on Wednesday, but it also includes these things. Um, something like IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, in an adult, all of you, and me, and everyone you know probably, in skeletal muscle in an adult body, the hormone that's responsible for the bulk of skeletal muscle remodeling, they're the most important one, is gonna be IGF-1. Muscles release it themselves. You can do autocrine signaling with IGF-1, mechano growth factor. So we'll talk about this stuff. Usually the liver releases a bunch of IGF-1 in bulk, um, so it's an endocrine. We'll talk about that stuff on on Wednesday, again, cell signaling cascades, you know this stuff, you know the major players in mTOR in that, in that I-5 of signaling cascades. Um, the difference between transcription and translation, we'll talk about the process of translation later. We'll do a couple of lectures on the genome and its expression on, on how genes behave and when I talk about increasing protein translation, that's a matter of genetic expression. We'll talk about those steps of genetic expression later, and it will be a little bit more meaningful to do in that order, I think, because you'll already have mTOR down. And all right, what are we talking about translation? What is translation? How does translation work? We'll go into some of those details at the end. You know this, sort of the big picture stuff, even though it seems like hyper-focused detail. Uh, but over here, you know, cell survival, PKD or AKT is halting stuff that is going to degrade proteins, apoptosis, let's stop all of that stuff. And then um, it's inhibiting mTOR inhibitors over here. So PKB is shutting off atrophy while turning on hypertrophy. You know the difference between complex one and complex two. The main 
major difference, Richter and Raptor, uh, regulatory associated protein of TOR, rapamycin insensitive companion of TOR. It's chronically rapamycin sensitive, acutely rapamycin insensitive. You know that one of the downstream targets of mTOR complex two is PKB, and PKB is upstream from complex one. So complex two is anabolic also, but complex one is your major channel for anabolism, your major channel for protein synthesis, for hypertrophy, for let's, let's grow ourselves some protein. mTOR complex one, that's the major conduit uh, to accomplish that. Complex two also contributes, but complex two has a lot of functions. Complex two has much broader functions and it's much less understood. Researchers don't understand complex two quite as effectively but when you get into some of these diagrams, uh, these diagrams are gonna get bigger and bigger and more and more crowded as we go, as we introduce more things, as we introduce more hormones, as we introduce nutrition, right? We've talked about carbs, so we haven't really talked about protein yet. When we get into protein specific amino acids, it's gonna grow and grow and grow and get more and more and more um, crowded. Now you can see amino acids over here on this one, cestrin, um, castor, the gator complexes, and we're looking at arginine and leucine as these two primary amino acids and how they're helping uh, translocate mTOR to the work site. But what we've been talking about is growth factors, all these growth factors and PKB and MAPK signaling. So over here we have MAPK signaling and over here is PKB signaling. And those two cascades, we've been focusing on PKB Right, upstream from PKB is mTOR complex two or a ton of other things are upstream from PKB. Um, downstream from PKB, we have mTOR complex one. Just remember that we did that baseball analogy last time, the nine players on the field, that there are a bunch of, for mTOR complex one to really function, there are a lot of critical players to how that cell signaling cascade carries out its function. Complex two, a little bit different, but complex one, you need a ton of refs, but in addition to those refs, um, the mTOR enzyme itself, it's a kinase. The mTOR enzyme is a kinase, meaning it attaches phosphates to things. When you attach a phosphate to something, you, you toggle its behavior. The target of rapamycin, mTOR, T-O-R, target of rapamycin is FKBB12, uh, right there. And Raptor, remember, is, is helping recruit downstream targets so that the kinase, so that mTOR, can affix its phosphates to those targets. P70, SSK, 4 ebp one it's getting that stuff uh, ready. And remember that Raptor can be phosphorylated at a number of sites. Some of them turn it on. Some of them facilitate or promote Raptor's behavior and other things inhibit. If you phosphorylate Raptor, you can inhibit its function. And so AMPK and MAPK, MAPK promotes Raptor, AMPK inhibits uh, Raptor. MLST8, the only stuff to really remember is it seems much more critical to complex two, to the assembly of complex two. In the presence of cancer, things can get a little bit weird. Things can get a little bit weird in the cell signaling and MLST8 or Gable, uh, might have, you know, a knockout might be a cancer drug in, in that particular case, but in normally functioning cell signaling, normally regulated cell signaling, uh, MLST8 is much more important to complex two, but it is in complex one also. It's a, in the collection of proteins in that mTOR complex, it's in both one and two. Um, but remember this right here is a recruiter of SGK, one of the downstream targets of mTOR complex two and Gable or, or, or MLST8 is this molecular bridge, they call it, between the kinase, between mTOR and uh, that recruiter, m sine one or sine one. Uh, so you know the immediately upstream and downstream stuff. Uh, tubrin, which is technically tuberous sclerosis complex two. Um, REB, REB needs its GTP to bind to mTOR to turn it on. And tubrin is facilitating the breakdown of that GTP so that REB can't turn on mTOR. So that's tubrin and REB. And then immediately downstream, we have P70S6K, 
sometimes S6K1 and just S6K, and then 4EBP1, and then ribosomal protein S6. This little guy right here, that one, let's say it's a gal, this little um, gal is, was identified a long time ago. And we commonly use ribosomal protein S6. Uh, it's phosphorylation state. Um, P70 S6 kinase phosphorylates it, right? So this, this gets phosphorylated. That K is a kinase, a kinase phosphorylate stuff, and this gets phosphorylated. The phosphorylation state of that S6 or RPS6, ribosomal protein S6, is a major indicator of whether mTOR is on, whether mTOR activity is currently, you know, active. And we actually don't know all that much about the precise functions of ribosomal protein S6. It's just if, if it's phosphorylated, mTOR is running, and if mTOR is running, we're, we're in hypertrophy mode. And, uh, but precisely how this thing behaves isn't quite untangled yet in the literature. But this right here is really, if you take rapamycin and inhibit mTOR, oh, you really knock out this. This can actually do a little bit still. You can still do this a little bit, but you oh, you just totally knocked this out uh, with rapamycin. And PRAS40, remember this is a negative regulator. Uh, it gets phosphorylated, it gets, it gets removed. Um, PKB and mTOR are going to withdraw its inhibition of mTOR activity. Deptor is the interesting one. Deptor and PRAS40 are both negative regulators of mTOR. Uh, let's not allow its kinase to do its phosphorylating. Let's not allow its kinase to do its kinasing. Um, so they're inhibiting that phosphorylation that mTOR can do. Um, and complex one does phosphorylate Deptor. But remember, Deptor opposes mTOR, but mTOR also opposes Deptor. The, the longer that you keep mTOR activity on, the expression of Deptor gets, gets reduced. And so they really are these quarreling kind of siblings in this complex. And Deptor is inhibiting mTOR, but mTOR is technically inhibiting Deptor in a different way. And Deptor, if it inhibits the kinase activity of mTOR, mTOR can't phosphorylate its downstream targets, but it also activates uh, PKB, Deptor does. And so uh, limits the apoptosis that might otherwise ensue with mTOR inhibition. Okay, we'll, we'll still cover some some review material, even though the review slides are, are missing up top, the little review section. Uh, we're still going to, a little new, a little review as we move forward into the mechanical signaling. But, so this is from old, like 1985, original Nintendo game, baseball. <clears throat> and this idea that mTOR, and we have these canonical proteins in the signal, but it can't run by itself. You know, one team can't go take the field and have a game of baseball. You need opponents, right? You need some, some alternative team also playing against. And so if you think about, we've been talking about MAPK, this cascade down here, and mTOR as two independent pathways. And we've mentioned that they intersect and, and that they, they rely on each other, but we'll talk a little bit more about that before, before moving on. So this up here, PI3K, right? Um, converts PIT2 to PIT3. Uh, phosphatidyl and nosotol, three kinase, it's a kinase, takes PIP with two phosphates and attaches a third phosphate. Um, that allows PDK to activate PKB. Um, PKB deactivates tuberin, right? So this is the mTOR signaling up here. And I just gave it 12 runs, sort of arbitrarily. Um, NAPK signaling, we have NEK, ERK, RSK. Um, that NAPK signaling, I gave it seven runs. This is just the Courtney appraisal, right? This is the Courtney appraisal of how important is mTOR relative to how important is NAPK. mTOR seems to be responsible for more protein synthesis, more hypertrophy, um, more anabolism than does MAPK. How much more? I don't know. Some more. It does some more. And so those are the those are the scores I gave it. But they do uh, interact and overlap, and um, they converge at some point. So over here you see PI3K mTOR, you know, pathway coming into AKT, coming to PKB, 
and PKB is uh, getting rid of PROS40, right? Let's, let's phosphorylate PROS40 to withdraw its inhibition. Um, let's turn off tuberin so that REB can retain its GTP and, and activate mTOR. And PKB does other stuff too. Um, glycogen synthase kinase, let's inhibit that. Uh, so other things that are going to facilitate this cascade. But over here we have MAPK. This MAPK pathway ending in RSK. Um, we are going to facilitate Raptor. We're going to inhibit tuberin. So MAPK via, via lots of things, but two of the most critical interactions, intersections with mTOR are uh, Raptor and tuberin. So these things converge, right? There's crosstalk is what they call this. Now also at the, at the downstream targets, where a lot of this stuff is, here's that MEK, uh, ERK, RSK. Ooh, the activity that this stuff has overlaps with the activity of PKB. So there's convergence, there's crosstalk. These two pathways don't exist in isolation. Um, now here, in a lot of these diagrams, it shows them existing in isolation. So this is mTOR over here, and you know, like all the stuff on here. Um, phosphatase intense and homolog, that, that's what this is. That's converting uh, PIP3 back into PIP2. Great if you have cancer, but you know, terrible if you're trying to grow. Um, PI3K is doing the opposite, right? So this would be the opposite of PI3K, that's insulin receptor substrate. And you know everything else on there. We'll talk about the RAGs when we talk about um, protein, amino acids. And over here, we have MAPK. So we have the MAPK signaling over here, there's RSK, and over here is PI3K. Now, stuff can activate both, and lots of things do. Lots of things, lots of ligands, lots of triggers are going to activate both of these. That doesn't mean they activate them equally. So take IGF, insulin-like growth factor super, super critical to anabolism, incredibly potent and powerful uh, hypertrophy inducer. So when people talk about the effects of growth hormone, you know, growth hormone makes you huge. How does growth hormone make you huge? Well, it causes the liver to release IGF-1. That IGF-1 does the bulk of the heavy lifting in terms of responding to the heavy lifting, I guess, literally. Uh, so IGF-1 is probably the most potent anabolic stimulator. And it activates both. IGF-1 is gonna target both, but it really targets PI3K. IGF-1 really does PI3K, PKB, mTOR. IGF-1 is a weak stimulator of MAPK. So sometimes when you're looking at these diagrams, you say, well, it just activates everything in the body. Yeah, but just because there is an activation, that doesn't comment on the potency of that relationship. And IGF-1 is a huge PI3K, PKB, mTOR stimulator, and it's a weak activator of NAPK. Now, you don't need to know any details on this slide, but just the philosophy, sort of physiological philosophy here, where this is NAPK over here, right? And this is mTOR, and how these two cascades interact, right? So those cross, inhibition, where they can negatively regulate each other, where there can be a little bit of negative regulation. And you see this when, if you inhibit mTOR, you might see, not always, you might see an increase in MAPK signaling as a compensatory mechanism. If you inhibit um, MAPK, the opposite. You'll see an increase in mTOR signaling. Is that what I just said? Whatever the opposite of what I just said was. MAPK, if you inhibit that, you can often see an increase in mTOR. mTOR, if you inhibit that, you can often see an increase in MAPK as a compensatory mechanism because we still need to meet our basal metabolism. Think about your appetite. There are lots of things that control appetite. Because if you lose your appetite, look, go to like um, a humane society, one of these like animal shelters or something. And there are dogs and probably cats that just sort of stop eating. 
they've lost their appetite. There's some sort of illness. They, they, they don't understand that they need to eat that chicken soup for survival. It's hard to use your words to express to the animal that those calories are required for survival. So you should just try to swallow them even though you're not hungry. It's hard to express that. So animals might, might end up starving. In people, man, we have a lot of overlapping inputs for hunger, right? I mean, whether it's the relationship between leptin and ghrelin, whether it is uh, neuronal, I mean, there's just like, you can take like a gunshot wound and, and sever the neuronal input and you're still gonna get hungry. Right, because if you stop getting hungry, it's potentially problematic. So there's overlapping inputs. And if, for instance, you address the leptin issue, you're gonna get hungry for other reasons. That's why leptin doesn't work as a supplement. The satiety hormone, yeah, but other stuff is gonna make you, is, is going to erase your satiety. Same thing with basal protein metabolism. You knock out one thing, but there's some overlap. Other stuff can compensate. And so that's what this is talking about, cross inhibition. Halfway cross talk activation, yeah, we've been talking about this one. You know, just think uh, uh, MAPK signaling with Raptor, MAPK signaling with Tuberin, cross talk. If you turn on MP MAPK, you're gonna get some mTOR activation through those uh, interactions. And then they do converge. We were looking at a slide just a second ago about their convergence. You don't really need to know those targets, the specific targets of convergence, stuff like that. But um, some of these downstream, really the ultimate downstream kind of finish lines of, of what these pathways are doing are uh, shared, right? They, they share some of these. So MAPK and mTOR, you know, I gave it that score of 12 to seven. That's just my subjective uh, appraisal uh, of these things. So um, looking at, based on the cancer subtype, this is often when people are, it's not just like bodybuilders are trying to get huge and all of the, med the medical studies are aimed at getting bodybuilders huge. That's not really what we're looking at. What we're looking at is if you inhibit, AM, if you inhibit uh, MAPK or if you inhibit mTOR, what are the, can what are the and to, to an oncologist, right? What are the effects? Pharmacologically, how does this affect the cancer uh, metastases or growth? And it depends. It depends on the patient. We're in the age of personalized therapies. Cell signaling can be a little bit personalized. And some of that is owing to what kind of cancer is present here. And this one, thyroid, don't write this specific stuff down. Just understand the concept of sometimes cell signaling is not as clean cut as it ought to be for the sake of ease and understanding. So thyroid cancers, uh, when people knock out MAPK, you do an inhibitor, you knock out MAPK, it doesn't seem to work that well. Um, there's compensatory mechanisms that it's as though you're not really doing any harm um, to the growth of cancer. Now, if you knock out uh, mTOR and inhibition of mTOR, and there was a 50% reduction in cell growth. Let's ignore MAPK and just knock out mTOR. Let's knock out MAPK and there wasn't really an effect of all this uh, compensation. But inhibit mTOR and you see a 50% reduction in cell growth. So mTOR does seem to be a little bit more important uh, than MAPK in these. And looking at phospho S6, again, this is just ribosomal protein S6. P70 S6K is the kinase that phosphorylates it. That just means mTOR is on, right? If that's being phosphorylated. This is sort of that last critical uh, step that everyone pays attention to. Um, is that thing phosphorylated and mTOR is on? If you knock out mTOR, more than 90% of the inhibition of that. Um, and there's a 50% reduction in cell growth. Um, but there is still this uh, compensatory phenomenon that you see. Knock out mTOR, and you see an increase in MAPK. So you're still gonna get some of that cell growth managed by an increase in, in MAPK in this particular presentation, right, this particular cancer. Um, and then vice versa, if you uh, knock out uh, MAPK, you get an increase in mTOR, right, phospho S6, that just means mTOR is on. If you knock out both, 
if you take out both mTOR and MAPK, that really seems to do the job. But again, it sort of depends. So in this one, totally different study. This is 2016. This one is from 2017. Um, in this one, there is extensive crosstalk between mTOR and the MAPK pathways previously documented. This study demonstrated that inhibition of MAPK uh, resulted in decreased phosphorylation of mTOR. Right? So it wasn't a compensatory mechanism um, where uh, you knock one out and the other one increases. This is one where you knock it out and we see decreased activity of the other. And they acknowledge that you know, this compensatory feedback loop was not observed in our study. They talked about compensatory signaling, but they didn't find it. What they found was that crosstalk. So it depends on the patient. Sometimes if you knock out MAPK, you can get more mTOR signaling as a compensatory mechanism and vice versa. Other times, if you knock out MAPK, for instance, mTOR suffers. It gets a little bit complicated depending on the individuality of the patient, uh, the biological circumstances, right? Exercise and cancer and, and what the scenario is influences how those cell signaling cascades uh, uh, play together on the playground. Um, so this one though, it's like overall, uh, recent rodent data, which is commonly what's used for mTOR, if you want to get a big dose of any of this stuff, humans are not really tested in pharmacological doses. And so some of the human literature is weakened by the dose. Like if you want to do a study on hangovers, you can't get people up to like a 0.08 and expect them to have a hangover the next day. You got to get up to like 0.2 for the blood alcohol content. And you don't see a lot of literature in which people are getting up to 0.2 blood alcohol content. Um, same thing with in looking at some of these mTOR, you know, if, if you're giving people um, an insufficient dose, rodents get the real dose. And so a lot of our understanding comes from, from rodents. Um, but with these uh, mTOR kinase inhibitors, uh, the mTOR complex one is necessary 30 to 50% of basal protein synthesis is coming from mTOR complex one. That's, that's the implication. Somewhere between a third and half of basal protein synthesis is coming from mTOR. Lots of stuff is responsible for basal protein synthesis. We haven't even talked about testosterone. This isn't talking about MAPK. This is just mTOR. mTOR basal protein synthesis. And this also isn't talking about exercise-induced hypertrophy. This is basal protein right here. When you get into hypertrophy, it's sort of interesting. Again, some rodents. Um, the, the mTOR complex one is sufficient to drive an increase in rates of protein synthesis uh, and skeletal muscle mass. As such, it is not surprising that the um, activation of skeletal muscle mTOR complex one signaling by various stimuli, including increased mechanical loading, has been implicated in the increased rates of protein synthesis and muscle hypertrophy. So this is a different phenomenon from basal protein synthesis. This is exercise induced hypertrophy, anabolism, protein accretion. mTOR is critical here. It's a third or a half of basal protein and it is critical if you want to grow. There's lots of things can cause growth and mTOR is critical to that. So we, we got into immune and chemicals last time. We'll do a quick recap of immune and chemicals, and then we'll go through mechanical tension. So with the immune and chemical stuff, remember a cytokine is a little protein released from a cell and it does signaling stuff. The cytokine, the small protein spit out by cells that do signaling. There are subsets of cytokines, chemokines, myokines. Myo means muscle, so a myokine is just a cytokine that a muscle spits out. Mechanically load the thing, exercise the thing, put the muscle cell through stress somehow, and it is going to spit out myokines. Tons of myokines, right? There's over 600 myokines. Almost all of those, nearly 600 of those, nobody has a clue 
um, the extent of their of their functioning. But there's some that have emerged in the evidence as compelling. Uh, BDNF we'll talk more about later, especially in brains. Um, that is that is incredibly critical. Um, interleukin 15, IL2 as well. IL6 tends to associate more with atrophy, lots of interleukins. Um, fibroblast growth factor, the spark, uh, decorin, uh, myonectin, and irisin. Um, all of these, we talked about this one a little bit before and its implications of the Beijing um, of, of fat cells, but um, all of these have found associations compelling enough uh, with PI3K, PKB, mTOR signaling, with hypertrophy. And so there's a bunch of myokine stuff the muscle releases, mostly in the presence of stress to say, or damage, damage or, or stress to say, hey, I need a little help. Uh, my resources have been consumed. My structural integrity has been threatened. Well, can we help uh, restore my um, pre-insult status? Can we get my structure back into, into full health? And then other stuff like myostatin, IL-6, uh, that a muscle is releasing associates with, with atrophy. But you see a lot of PKB here, right? All of these things, mostly PI3K, PKB. This is the main signaling cascade these things are going through. There is overlap with MAPK in these, uh, but the bulk of it is going through uh, PKB. So decorin or inhibiting, lots of stuff is inhibiting something that's, that's atrophy. Like folostatin. If you want to do folostatin as a drug, that's a myostatin binding protein. It inhibits the effects of myostatin, myostatin supercatabolic. So if you inhibit myostatin, that is in itself anabolic because myostatin is super catabolic. And so things that inhibit myostatin, decorin, um, it would be would be one of them as a myokine. Uh, but one of its effects is inhibition of PKB, myostatin inhibiting PKB. But going through PKB really is this, this journey that a lot of these uh, myokines and other hormones, as well as mechanical loading, uh, take. Interferon gamma, make sure that one is written down too. Interferon gamma is another one. Uh, and we see going through PI3K here, this whole uh, image, most of the stuff on here you're familiar with. Uh, now, again, nutrients we'll talk a little bit more about. I mean, there's, there's nothing uh, here that, you know, just nutrients in a big arrow. We'll, we'll talk about that. But you know AMPK, you know tuberin, you know REV, that's glycogen synthase kinase, there's PKB, PDK that's activating it, um, so the, the PI3K. So this is just cell surface receptors um, up here. And uh, what AKT, you know, what hexokinase and PFK and endothelial nitric oxide synthase, there's glycolysis. Over. So there's the um, caspase 9. So you're, you should be familiar with a lot of the stuff that's now appearing in what appears to be super cluttered diagrams. You'll start recognizing all of these and they make a little bit more sense. You know, you put this big map in front of you. I don't know where we are. Like, oh, I see Stockton, oh, and Lodi. And then you start to know where you are if you scrutinize these maps a little bit. Um, TNF, tumor necrosis factor, make sure that one's written down too, TNF. Um, plenty of data about this, and you see this parallel activation of MAPK and PKB, mTOR. So mTOR and MAPK, parallel activation of those two. Uh, the Wnt proteins, remember, these are inhibiting glycogen synthase kinase, and through that we get this domino effect of mTOR activation. And um, with reactive oxygen species, free radicals or reactive oxygen species, remember a huge dose is bad. A huge dose is uh, impairing mTOR signaling, impairing anabolic signaling. Uh, biological, physiological, normal dose that you would experience with exercise, elevated reactive oxygen species will occur with exercise. That is a stimulus. But if supplements come out that show increased mTOR activation with reactive oxygen species. So make sure you take you know, this, this like reactive oxygen bolstering uh, compound. That's not helpful. A little bit doesn't always do the same thing as a lot bit, right? A, a huge dose 
can sometimes have an opposite effect of the little doses. And then the last one, just remember prostaglandins, know where these things come from and how they work. So prostaglandins come from arachidonic acid, maybe 10%, 20%, somewhere in there. Uh, the fatty acids that are going to be in this phospholipid bilayer, 10 to 20%, something like that, will be arachidonic acid, this 20 carbon fat. And you convert it into stuff. PLA2, phospholipase A2, releases arachidonic acid, so now it's free. And cyclooxygenase converts it into prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, when they bind, are going to do uh, MEPK signaling. So we're going to get MAPK signaling with prostaglandins. They will also depolarize nociceptors, pain nerves, and let you know that you had a good workout yesterday or maybe even two days ago. They'll let you know that you had a, you had a good workout. And stuff like uh, the NSAIDs, right? This is blocking cyclooxygenase. So if you block cyclooxygenase, you don't get the prostaglandin signaling, or at least you really reduce the prostaglandin signaling. So you really reduce MAPK signaling. So you really reduce muscle regeneration after a workout. If you are an athlete taking NSAIDs, so you can get back on the field or the diamond or the court or the whatever, um, what you're doing is permitting acute participation without pain at the sacrifice of tissue integrity, at the sacrifice of progress. Your tissues do not regenerate effectively in the presence of NSAIDs. And after a good workout, after a good resistance training workout, uh, I don't know, 48 hours, something like that, you, you might have mTOR activation going. If you take an acute inhibitor, let's say you take rapamycin. At hour one, at hour three, a lot of experiments in these short-term uh, administrations of rapamycin, you're, you're abolishing protein synthesis. But at hour 24, eh, you're doing okay. You're, you're fine, you know? And start thinking about the half-life of some of these things. Start thinking about how long is this effect uh, from rapamycin? How long is this lasting? And, you know, if, if you're a few hours in, uh, this, is a, this is a pronounced effect. Over time, if you're, if you're translating protein at an elevated rate for, say, 48 hours or something, rapamycin isn't, gonna, isn't going to abolish all 48 hours of it. But let's say you are taking NSAIDs every few hours so you can participate, this may present a challenge that lingers throughout the protein translation duration. Um, and remember that Raptor, Raptor is so important. Uh, it's so important as a hub for crosstalk, as a place where inhibitors and promoters send their signal, enact their inhibition uh, or promotion. Raptor is such an important hub for that stuff. Okay, so that's everything that we've talked about so far. Uh, so far, we'll do mechanical tension today, and then again uh, endocrine and nutrition afterward. We'll do endocrine on Wednesday, and then we'll follow up with nutrition later, and then really get into uh, inhibition, AMPK, and uh, exercise strategies, supplements, um, science-based. Uh, interventions of, of mTOR promotion and how to avoid mTOR inhibition. So uh, your muscle, if I were to take this hunk of muscle here and I throw it at Marie, she's going to catch it, okay? With relative, I can do this to anybody. I just throw it at her and you're going to be able to catch it. If I asked you, to calculate the trajectory, you know, you can use the, whatever, the angle of attack and, and um, if there's wind resistance and the height and the speed and all this stuff. I say, calculate where this thing's going to land. Oh, I don't know, like, could you do it today? You know, it's like, okay, when's this due is the immediate question. Like, how long do I have? Do I, do I have to like, turn it in by the end of the day? It would take a long time to calculate that stuff. But you're, you just do it, right? An outfielder's like, oh, the ball's coming over here. And maybe a little bit of course correction, something like that. Um, your inners are better physicists than your outers. Your inners are great physicists. And a, and a component of that is 
uh, mechanotransduction. You have proteins that live inside of your tissue, sometimes transmembrane proteins that cross the membrane, uh, that, live, that live in and around and, and embedded within your tissue, that are paying attention to everything your tissues are doing, the nature of a load and how it is applied, when it is applied, the rate of application, the angles, the speeds, the duration that has to be held. Is there movement within? Is it isometric? Is it isotonic? Is this concentric and slow or fast? Is it eccentric or eccentric? And, and what all of this information is understood by your cells. If you think about those huge trampolines, you know, those giant trampolines with the springs all around them. And depending on how you jump on the trampoline, deforms the springs differently. Those springs are proteins in your body. You know, if, if the giant trampoline, if you're jumping, like let's say the entire room is a trampoline and where Ryan is sitting, you're like somewhere in the, in the middle, somewhere between like Ryan and Kevin is like the middle of the room. And you're just like doing like this jump over and over in the middle. All the springs are, are deformed, distorted, sort of similarly. You move to the side a little bit and you're changing the angle of deformation. You're changing how much strain goes into some springs as compared to other springs. When you jump faster or higher or do a cannonball or a starfish, you further change the influence that motion has on the deformation of springs. The springs don't give a shit. Right, they, unless they're rusty and they break or something. Springs, springs don't relay information, they don't behave, they don't change their behavior. Proteins in the body recognize this, change it into chemical signals, and do mechanotransduction, cell signaling with a mechanical input. So integrins are probably the most important one, integrating the extracellular matrix, you know, fiber, nectin, and collagen, the space out immediately outside of the cell. They integrate what is happening, right? The deformation of, of extracellular matrix, they cross the membrane, a transmembrane protein, and then they relay that signal into the cell through a kinase called FAK, focal adhesion kinase. Integrins are one of them. The most studied, the most understood in terms of mechanotransduction properties. But it's not the only one. It's possible it's not the most important one. Now, this is from you know, cardiac function. Let's look at the cytoskeletal architecture of a heart. Uh, but you see all of these uh, sarcomeres, right? So the, uh, an M, a Z disc and an M line, uh, the middle and, and the end. So remember, a sarcomere is Z disc to Z disc. And in the middle is your M line. Titan. 30,000 amino acids long, huge protein, largest protein in the universe that we know of, goes from Z to M line. It goes half the distance of the sarcomere. That is an intracellular signaler, a protein that is detecting information within the cell. Now, Titan gets stretched when you elongate a sarcomere. And when it contracts, right, Titan is less stretched. It functions as this as this rubber band within the cell. And when you stretch out that rubber band, it notices and relays that information. So you see Titan uh, up here. So there's within the sarcomere, this little blue thing that's gonna be Titan. You know what acted in myosin are, right? Those are the filaments that slide in sliding filament theory. Um, cadherins and a catenin or catena, plural, um, adherins junction and just like with um, integrins, right? You need FAK, focal adhesion kinase. There has to be a way of relaying this information. So a cell to cell communication. If you're gonna communicate from one cell to the next, um, that's cadherence, calcium adherence, cadherence. Uh, extracellular matrix, that's what, that's what all this stuff is. And so then you see the integrins 
and focal adhesion kinase. If you can see what I'm pointing at from, from where you are, this little orange thing, that's focal adhesion kinase, that's a relay information about the ECM, the extracellular matrix inside of the cell. So there are uh, proteins that sense intercellular load, meaning cell to cell, from one cell to the next. What your neighbor is doing, you notice, is this, right? We have a bridge between them. Um, catenin, I think, comes from the, the root word of chain, or where these things are chained together. So here's one cell, here's a cell. There's a bridge between communication, crosstalk, cellular crosstalk. An intracellular load, meaning within the cell, would be tightened. Intracellular signaling is going to be tightened. This is the most studied and, and understood of the intracellular uh, uh, proteins that will be relaying this information. The extracellular load, meaning going from inside to the extracellular matrix, so immediately outside of the cell. This is this is like if you're, if you're talking about coherence, this is your house and your neighbor's house two different houses and you have like tin cans of string and you can talk to each other through them. Do you have eggs? I need eggs. You know, you're talking to your half neighbor through tin cans of string. Um, intracellular load, that's like the thermostat inside the house or whatever. This doesn't, this is just inside. The extracellular load is like from your yard. What's happening in my yard? Let's relay that information inside of the house. So these proteins, so here is your Titan. It doesn't quite look like this, but it goes from, here's the Z disc. This is just a sarcomere, right? This is a muscle. Here's your myosin right there. Here's your actin right here, the Z disc. Uh, actin is, is held in place by alpha actin. And then here's your, uh, your uh, Titan doing this, going to the M line. Tons of proteins live in the M line. Right here, tons of proteins live there. So it's not just like a hypothetical made up mill. Um, like when I was saying, somewhere between Ryan and Kevin is the middle of the room. That's not what the M line is. The M line is actual architecture, it lives there. You just don't often see it in these diagrams. Um, but so there's your Titan. And as a sarcomere stretches, Titan notices and can relay that message. There's a lot of stretch happening here. And it recoils, it's a rubber band, it helps recoil. Uh, there's a lot of functions of Titan. Um, you know, as stabilizers of, of myosin, um, template organizer, and then some of that elasticity. Titan has a lot of functions, but one of those functions is mechanotransduction. One of those functions is detecting uh, load profiles and sending that information along. So this right here, um, this stuff here is Titan. Titan right there. Um, the rubber band of the sarcomere. Now, when I talk about transmembrane proteins, trans cross a, mem a membrane, cadherins and integrins are transmembrane proteins. Um, think about a hermit crab. You know those hermit crabs that you can get from like a little, the same place where you can like buy goldfish for 10 cents, just some little like, I don't know, can you get that at Walmart now? Does Walmart have a line that sort of stinks of like, you know, tropical fish and whatever? Okay, so whatever, like, you know, PetSmart or I, I don't know, whatever, whatever store where you can go buy your hermit crabs. Now the hermit crabs are huddled inside of their shells for safekeeping. And every once in a while, they put their feelers out there, right? They're a little like all of their limbs. And stuff. They sort of come out and they test the environment, right? Oh, it's safe. I can come out and explore. Whatever. Oh, it's like freezing. Or oh, there's a predator. Or oh, it's information. I'm testing outside of my shell for information. And then my behavior changes accordingly. Transmembrane proteins are kind of similar. That's what your appetite does. That's what your appetite is for. Hunger. That is a... a Hermit crab feeler is hunger. Hunger is, I don't need to eat. It's not urgent that I eat. But I just want to make sure food is available. I need to make sure urgency isn't headed my way. So I'm going to send out some feelers. I'm a little bit hungry. Let's see what happens. 
if you go put food in your mouth, that means food's available. Like, all right, all right, all right. You don't, you don't get starving and you just like consume a ton of food. It's like, if you're grazing, you get a little bit hungry, you take like three bites and your body's like, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, there's food available. It's a hermit crab. Send the feelers out there saying, just change your behavior. Here's a signal. And transmembrane proteins do a very similar thing. Outside of the cell, what's it like? What's it like out there? What sort of deformity is being put upon us? What is happening immediately outside of the cell? Let's relay that information to the interior of the cell. So we're sensing things in the outside, extracellular, and we're relaying that information on the, the plasma membrane right here. That's like where your arachidonic acid lives. Stuff is in here. And then the intracellular domain down here, that's where that relay gets set. So if this were um, an integrin, right, we would have the integrin and then it would relay the information through focal adhesion kinase, FAK, and then send that information all over the place to the inside. Now we've been studying this for a while. Mechanotransduction has been a fascinating uh, field of, of study because it works a little bit differently from the chemical stuff, from the hormonal stuff, uh, immune and, and you know, myokine and, and you know, classic hormones. Stuff. Those things have some overlap with mechanotransduction, but there's also independent signaling, um, independent ways. And so lots of, you know, this is 2008, people are already studying this stuff, you know, mechanical stimuli of skeletal muscle, implications on mTOR. So mTOR being stimulated through the load itself, 2008. Uh, here's one from 2009. Again, changes in muscle mass with mechanical load, not the hormones, not, not the um, cytokines, stuff like that. Um, 2011, 2012, looking at mechanotransduction pathways. This is the advent of more the explosion, maybe not the advent, but the explosion of investigation in mechanical signaling this is like 10 years ago. Like 10 years ago is really when people started studying this stuff. And here's where it gets really fascinating. Um, tendons don't have inflammation. Tendons do not get inflamed. And so tendonitis is a made up term for like a fantasy disease. It doesn't exist. Uh, I mean, if you go back to like the Middle Ages or something and, and whatever, oh, you know, you're poisoned by, you know, you're, you're possessed by demons. That's why your humors are out of alignment or whatever it is. Tendonitis might as well be talking about unbalanced humors for all the reality it possesses. Tendons don't get inflamed. Now, we know inflammation is a chemical profile that can depolarize nociceptors, but it also stimulates regeneration of the tissue. Inflammation is going to occur in the presence of tissue disruption, tissue injury, problems like this. You will see an inflammatory profile that is there to alert you, hey, don't use this for a minute, right? It's, it's a little bit um, rickety at the moment. I need to fix this up. But the inflammation is also the signal for fixing. The inflammation is also, I mean, think like prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, go beat up some tissue in the weight room, you're super sore tomorrow. A lot of what you're feeling is prostaglandins. And prostaglandins, while depolarizing nociceptors, are also stimulating MAPK for growth. The same thing that says, ooh, I'm waving a flag, just please don't put a bunch of weight on this while I'm trying to fix it up is also doing the fixing, summoning all of those fixing agents. Tendons don't have that luxury. Tendons do not get to heal themselves by inflammatory pathways. Tendons are really bad healers for that reason, for some reasons, this being one of the reasons. Tendons are terrible healers. Especially if somebody is trying to treat a tendon pathology with anti-inflammatories or whatever, like that's not even, what are we talking about? Tendons are really responsive to mechanical loads. Mechanical loads are the language of, of tendinopathies, of, of tendon pathologies. 
applying those mechanical loads. Now here's an integrand. Over here, we're like growth factors, right? So we're gonna like bind some growth factor, but this is an integrand. Here's an extracellular matrix, glycoproteins and stuff, and collagen out here and whatever. The integrand, noticing what's happening, it's transmembrane protein. There's focal adhesion kinase, FAK. It's a kinase. It's gonna activate lots of stuff. So over here, you see MAPK. Right? Over here, somewhere, PI3K. Right? So there's, we're, we're going through MAPK. We're going through PI3K, mTOR. Integrins are going to be doing both. Um, just more breadth of signaling um, through focal adhesion kinase. You see uh, communication with cadherins over there. Remember, cadherins are cell to cell. But we've talked about PI3K and, and, and MAPK. So there's four ways that mechanical loads that we know of really seem to induce hypertrophy. PI3K, MAPK, fine, got it, right? Cell signaling, just the cell signaling cascades we've been talking about. The DGK pathway also. We've mentioned very briefly, I think a couple of times when we were talking about lipolysis. I said adipose triglyceride lipase goes from triacylglycerol or triglyceride to diacylglycerol. Once you have a diacylglycerol to fatty acids on it, once you have that thing, what do you do with it? Well, hormone sensitive lipase can convert it into a monoacylglycerol. Or you could use diacylglycerol kinase, throw a phosphate on that thing. This is a kinase convert it into phosphatidic acid. Phosphatidic acid is an mTOR stimulator. So that's one option of what to do with a diacylglycerol. Um, now this, I've uploaded this article because it's a really good one a couple of lectures ago. This mTOR signaling at a glance, I keep referencing this article. But in 2009, when it came out, um, this pathway, DGK, uh, we were talking about it from the perspective of PLD, PLD2. Um, so there's it, like PLD1, PLD2. Uh, these, this is um, DGK. So this isn't something else. This isn't like a totally different cascade that we're adding to this. This has been replaced shortly after. Here's a 2013 article um, shortly after talking about um, DGK. That's the pathway by which uh, this happens. Now, later I'll talk about, can you eat it, right? Can you eat phosphatidic acid, this thing that is created as a supplement, just like we did weight loss, fat loss, the supplements that actually work. We'll do supplements that actually work for muscle gain. We'll do that. Uh, and this is one of them, phosphatidic acid, what DGK creates. But if you eat it, it's an MAPK stimulator. You convert it to lysophosphatidic acid and it, and it tends to, it appears to be an MAPK uh, pathway. So a slightly different pathway as compared to mechanical loading stimulated. If you stimulate this pathway through mechanical loading to get your PA endogenously. So there's your diacylglycerol, right? Your triglyceride minus a lipid, uh, minus a fatty acid. There's your phosphatidic acid. Right, DG kinase, throw a phosphate on there. Um, and this is phosphatidic acid. Phosphatidic acid is a direct stimulator of mTOR and mechanical loading, applying loads to the tissues really turns uh, this pathway on. Um, this one talking about um, exogenous phosphatidic acid, right there being multiple mechanisms. And it's not quite the same thing. It's not quite as effective uh, doing this. Now, getting into what are called stretch activated channels, I meaning let's get some calcium into the cell. Um, this diagram comes from this book. It's a little bit older, but these stretch activated channels are permitting the influx of calcium into the cell. Now, calcium regulates lots of stuff. You know that calcium binds to troponin C inside of the cell, C for calcium, permitting cross-bridge 
cycling, permitting um, the formation of actin myosin bonds, sliding filament theory. But during exercise, as you get that calcium into the cell, one thing is mTOR seems to be sensitive to intracellular calcium. Get a little bit more in there, and you're likely to have a little bit more mTOR signal. During eccentric or eccentric uh, muscle actions, you're going to have more stretch activated channel activity, more intracellular calcium, and seems to be more consequent mTOR. A couple of articles looking at that. Again, rodents are so much easier to work with than humans, but there's work on, on humans in this stuff. Um, this is a good article talking about calcium and you know, essential for contractile activity. That's a troponin C stuff. Um, but also uh, changes in the intracellular calcium concentrations regulate the physiological activities of calmodulin. Calmodulin is a multifunctional signal transducer that undergoes conformational changes before activating a wide range of binding substrates made of blah, 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 calcineurin. So once you get that calcium into the cell, that influx of calcium, you can activate calcineurin. What's a phosphatase as opposed to a kinase? Yeah, let's, instead of phosphorylating, let's remove it. Let's remove the, so this is the opposite uh, of that thing. So calcineurin is going to do a, you know, a major role in a variety of physiological activities. Uh, muscle regeneration is, is among them. And the regulation of satellite cell behavior for calcineurin. So get more intracellular calcium exercise, especially uh, eccentric loads applied to the tissue, more intracellular calcium, activate calcineurin, regulate satellite cell behavior. Um, and then in these, in these studies in which you inhibit calcineurin, you see atrophy. In studies in which you promote calcineurin, you see repair and remodeling. So you can do the big picture stuff, or you can look at the actual uh, pathways of, of what is happening with them. Um, now, downstream from IGF, remember IGF, the most critical regulator uh, of skeletal muscle mass in terms of this, these cell signaling cascades, uh, you mostly get PI3K, you get an APK too, but it's, it's just more about PI3K. Downstream from that, you do see calcineurin. Activation. So there is a relationship. I'm not sure how potent that relationship is, but IGF, you do seem to trigger a calcineurin response. And among the other effects of calcineurin is antagonism of myostatin. So it sort of plays a similar role, not the same role, but a similar function carries out of something like tholestatin. Um, if we can inhibit myostatin, while regulating satellite cell activity in an anabolic way, calcineurin uh, has the pathways that indicate hypertrophy. And when you interact with it, you get that effect. It isn't as well understood as some of these other pathways, uh, but it is anabolic. Now, mechanical signaling, there's so many different possible mechanisms of this. Uh, IGF. You're going to get local IGF release with mechanical signaling. You don't need it to come from the liver, right? You can get mechanical growth factors straight out of the muscle and you can get autocrine signaling and get a bunch of PI3K, PKB, a little bit of MAPK and a little more calcineurin uh, signaling that way. Uh, mechanical loads, stretch activated channels, let's get some calcium in. Um, you will get that one. Um, so there's the um, calmodulin and, and calcineurin. Um, so there's IGF dependent and IGF independent modes of mechanical signal. It doesn't all go through PI3K PKB. You know, phosphatidic acid is not a PI3K PKB pathway. That's a totally different way of, 
of activating mTOR. So let's say you load up skeletal muscle, you go to the weight room and do your whatevers, your like lunges or bench or something, and you do it in the presence of rapamycin. What happens to anabolic signaling? It's turned off. It's turned off. Yeah, there's no anabolic signaling in the presence of rapamycin. You know, maybe a day later or something like that. You know, if you work out in the morning and, and take rapamycin with your workout, and then at dinner time you test, okay, you can get some translation, if, as long as you don't kind of re up the dose of rapamycin. But yeah, you're turning it off. You're turning that off. You abolish the hypertrophic uh, response. Tons of evidence for this, study after study after study. Uh, introduce rapamycin and a mechanical load or, or any type of stimulus of mTOR, and you're abolishing a lot of that response. Um, <sighs> Part of the, the effect of it is, is an allosteric inhibition that you get. Now, allosteric means bind to an alternative site and mess up the active site. Bind somewhere else, you know, like a, an outlet, like an outlet in the wall, like those ones that are hanging from the ceiling. There's multiple plugs in those things. If you were to plug something into one of those sockets, and then suddenly the other sockets change their shape and could no longer accept a plug, that would be allosteric inhibition. There can also be allosteric activation, but that's not what's, what's happening. So this allosteric blocking um, of access of, of the um, substrates for mTOR. Um, so it's a very potent inhibitor, rapamycin. Now, wartmenin, this metabolite of a fungus, grows on pineapples, Wartmenin is a PI3K inhibitor. If you exercise, you go to the gym, you're not going to like get a bunch of Wartmenin by eating pineapples, but it's a PI3K inhibitor. And if you take Wartmenin and go to the gym and exercise, you block a lot, an enormous amount of anabolic signaling, but not all of it. You don't block all of it because you know, with nutrients and growth factors, you're really knocking out almost all growth factor signal uh, when you do that. IGF, stuff like this, sort of pointless now. Insulin and IGF and a lot of these uh, myokines, stuff like that, these are sort of pointless now because those, those are really going through PI3K. The wartmenin is a PI3K inhibitor. But canotransduction though, you knock out some of it. You know, IGF can't do its thing. We see DGK, the DAGK, diacylglycerol kinase, whatever, DGK, and phosphatidic acid um, activating mTOR. If you take rapamycin, you really block pretty much everything. Pretty effectively. Not 100%, but pretty effectively. If you do workmen, you don't block mechanical signaling all the way. Mechanical signaling still gets through. The application of a load there is an implication that the application of load is the most important signal there is. It's the only one that still gets through. Unless you take right at the finish line, you can take everything out. Um, now, as we, as we begin to talk about nutrients, um, and we're talking about you know, leucine and arginine and stuff like that, you see this VPS 34 and wartmenin inhibiting that. Like wartmenin is a PI3K inhibitor. That's a, a type of PI3K. Um, so we'll talk about nutrients um, a little bit later, but this is a general look at what happens. These growth factors and nutrients trying to turn on mTOR. Wartmenin is just shutting off that switch. Mechanical stimuli can still get through though. Not all of it. Some of it is IGF dependent, not all of it, but some mechanical stimuli still gets through. Now if you take a rat with mycin, you sort of knock out everything. Not perfectly. Um, for EBP1, you might still see a little bit of mTOR activity with that, but pretty much you knock out everything uh, with rapamycin. Now this study, uh, there was a few findings that they had about the importance of mechanical signaling. And so there's three different findings in the report. One, mechanical stimuli induce a robust activation. RS means rapamycin sensitive, just like mTOR complex one a robust activation of complex one dependent signaling. Mechanical stimuli really turn on mTOR complex one, a huge activation of complex one. Number two, changes 
in P70SSK, ribosomal protein S6, that sort of terminal um, uh, roadway of, of mTOR. Uh, changes in that phosphorylation are a valid marker for the mechanical activation of mTOR, dependent signaling. So downstream from mTOR, um, you know, let's phosphorylate ribosomal protein S6. That's a really reliable way of seeing if mTOR is on. And it really turns on in the presence of mechanical signaling. Number three, mTOR complex one is necessary for at least a subset of the mTOR dependent uh, signaling events that are induced by mechanical stimuli. So mTOR complex one is very sensitive to mechanical stimuli. It doesn't have to go through um, PI3K, PKB, right? There are other pathways to get to mTOR um, in mechanical signaling. And looking at hypertrophy, looking at the growth, the remodeling, you know, based on our results, we have concluded that signaling through uh, mTOR complex one is necessary for mechanical overload induced hypertrophy, but it is not required for a mechanical overload induced increase in protein synthesis. So then why is signaling through rapamycin sensitive mTOR complex one dependent mechanism necessary for a hypertrophic response? So this is a, an interesting question because what it says is if you want to have hypertrophy, you want to grow, you gotta have mTOR complex one doing this stuff. Basal protein synthesis of, okay, we just need to get our, our minimum kind of repairing of tissues and basal protein synthesis. Remember mTOR, it's a third, maybe it's a half, something like that of, of these sort of basal synthesis. And you can still get some of this. You can still get some of this uh, if you're knocking out mTOR. Um, MAPK signaling, for example. Remember in those different cancers, you know, thyroid cancer, and look at these different cancers, the relationship between MAPK and, and mTOR. And we're going to try to manage protein translation. We're going to try to manage our tissues the best we can, even in the presence of mTOR knockout, but we're not going to hypertrophy. We'll be able to manage, but we're not going to hypertrophy if we knock out uh, mTOR. Now it gets a little bit more complicated. Don't write this down, but, um, but when you start mingling chemicals and mechanical signaling at the same time, you get a more complicated story. Nothing exists in isolation. There's overlap with all these things. So integrins, transmembrane protein, um, they trigger the production of reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species regulate the signaling functions from coherence. There's more to it when you include from immune system chemicals and mechanical tension together. But the summary of mechanical loading is we have uh, intercellular load, right, cell to cell some coherence here. We have intracellular within the cell, some tightening here. We have extracellular loads, meaning extracellular matrix immediately outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. We have integrants, and this is relaying, this is mechanotransduction relaying information uh, to, for repair and remodeling, for specificity of adaptation. What is the nature of that load? Uh, well, these proteins, detected that and relay that information so you can restructure the muscle uh, accordingly. Same picture we've already looked at for, for that stuff. And the PI3K and MAPK pathways, mechanical loading works through both of those, also works through DGK, diacylglycerol kinase, and then the influx of calcium into the cell. And that's it for mechanical loading. Are we okay with the application of loads? I don't need to have any, um, the others don't have to have very, very little, like six to eight weeks, or like something like that. Yeah. Why is that if there is such sensitive and uh, It's a really good question. Uh, a lot, it's just so expensive to do mTOR. Um, if mTOR is on and you're translating proteins, that can be 50% of the cell's cost. And the body is really conservative. You'll have 
regeneration. You, you'll, you'll have, let's get back to a baseline, let's repair the damage that's done. But hypertrophy of let's make this tissue even bigger and stronger, there's a delay in that. And the cause of that delay in terms of mTOR, I'm not sure. In what is the inhibition um, early on, I am not sure. But, but yeah, what you see is a bunch of uh, neurological changes in its place. That's really the question. All right. Go, go do stuff.